Welcome in, folks, here on Big Blue View's YouTube page and also audio lineup. I'm Joe DeLeon, joined by Nick Filato and Chris Fum for today's post-game film breakdown of the New York Giants Week 6 loss to the Los Angeles Rams, a game that Chris and I had quoted after uh, the abysmal performance as just embarrassing. And I think that's going to be a, a similar talking point today because of lo a lot of what we saw yesterday was just a lack of effort, a lack of energy, uh, and a team that felt like they gave up after a certain point. So, Nick, we haven't gotten to hear from you and your perspective on those things. So I'm curious just to get your take. Are, were you kind of in the same boat as Chris and I after that game where there's not really a whole lot to take away from it because it, it just felt like, the, like they started to give up early on? I don't know if give up is the right word. And for anybody on the Big Blue View podcast feed, go check out Falato on Football. I rant about this game for about 15 minutes to open the show. I don't know if give up is the right word. It's just that they, are, they lost to a much better football team. They're not in the same class as the Los Angeles Rams. And that was more than evident after the Rams were allowed to make certain adjustments against Patrick Graham and his defense, because we saw some coverage sacks earlier on. We saw maybe a simplified defensive look that resulted in those coverage sacks from Leonard Williams, a little bit of Dexter Lawrence, who had half a sack. Those were the first two Rams drives. But once the second quarter rolled around and Sean McVay was able to make some adjustments, it was full go. 28 points in a quarter, guys. 28 damn points in a quarter. Scored in just a variety of different ways as well taking advantage of match mistakes from this Giants defense, taking advantage of Tay Crowder, who was isolated in man coverage, a double move, getting beat by a double move again. Does that remind you of week two against Washington? <laughs> so it's just – it's it's a, the New York Giants getting beat by a team that is significantly better than them. That's, that's what I would say right now. And that's the current state of the Giants. There are a lot of teams that are significantly better than them. But when you allow a team to come into your home and do that to you – I mean, geez, that is, that's, that's just disappointing, which is a word that I've used so many times to describe this 2021 New York Giants team. Well, I, I think that's really the best word to describe them. You know, maybe, maybe we're the fools for getting our, getting our hopes up based on the Giants offseason <laughs> moves. And, you know, maybe we overestimated how a lot of these guys were going to play. But, you know, if, if our expectations were low, maybe this game wouldn't be quite so disappointing. Uh, and uh, honestly, Chris, I have to say, at this point, we're not the fools. I, I, as much <laughs> as, as much as I'd like to say, like, oh, we're you know, we made the mistake of getting buying in too much. They lay, they have made a lot of moves and spent a lot of money over the last two off seasons, and it feels like most of it hasn't really panned out. At a certain point, you do kind of have to say, this isn't on the fans for getting our hopes up. This is on the the organization for not putting out a team that's capable of producing at least a competitive product. And I know they're dealing with a lot of injuries and they were dealing with injuries at receiver in this game, which hampered the, the, the passing offense, but a lack of depth is apparent. I, I, I at the very least would like to watch a game against what's probably a, a top at the very minimum, a top 10 team in the NFL right now, possibly top five team in the NFL in, in the Rams, at least to stay competitive. I'm not asking for uh, that game for them to come out and win defiantly by multiple touchdowns. That's not going to happen. But for them to at least stay within a couple scores throughout the entire, uh, entirety of the game seemed impossible and highly unlikely after the second quarter. It, it was, too. And Chris, yeah. man, Matt Stafford, dude, was pulled. He was pulled yeah. in the beginning of the fourth quarter. Yeah. Like, that's all you, we need to know. We see Johnny Wolford truck out there, and I'm like, are, are we kidding right now? <laughs> you know, Jones yeah. stays in through the entirety of the game, too, taking unnecessary hits. It's, I mean, when I think Ed put this in one of his articles, and I've said this on our podcast as well, when you, when you don't think it can get any worse, it continues to. And that's yeah. the state of the Giants right now, man. When it rains, it freaking pours. Yeah. It, I basically had to say the same thing in my post game post as well. It's just it, whenever you think they're at a low point, they whip out the jackhammer and make a hole in the basement. It's it, it's almost unbelievable at this point, but it just seems to keep getting worse. And yeah, we're we're not really talking about the film right now, but there's not a whole hell of a lot to talk about with the film. It was just bad 
especially after you know they had that first quarter where they were somehow able to get down into the red zone for the Rams. I I asked Joe just before the Giants kicked their field goal, I was like, how do they still have possession of this ball? Because they should have lost possession a few times on that drive. Mm. But yeah, they they kept things competitive in the first quarter. And then Sean McVay did Sean McVay things. Matt Stafford did Matt Stafford things, which just as an aside, watching him throw the football is just impressive. It literally jumps off of his hand. I, I'm not quite sure how he does it. But yeah, you know, it seems like the only way the Giants can keep up with a competitive team is the same way they won against the Seattle Seahawks last year and the New Orleans Saints this year, where the other team doesn't play up to their capabilities. They make mistakes. They don't take advantage of the opportunities they get. And then the Giants just manage to not shoot themselves in the foot. (laughs) Which is a lot to ask these days. It is. (laughs) So speaking on that, you mentioned we're not, I haven't gotten into the film yet. And like you've mentioned that there's not really much to unpack, but I think that there are some things that we can dive a little bit deeper on. Daniel Jones had what was easily his worst game of the season, uh, three, throws three interceptions. He actually wasn't turning the ball over that badly over the first five games of the year. And then it seems like all of those what-if mistakes where he maybe should have gotten picked off or the ball should have been fumbled, it all came crashing down against what was one of the better defenses in the NFL. So those three interceptions were were critical in this game. He throws over 50 passing attempts, which – tends to lend itself to be a disastrous scenario for for Daniel Jones specifically. But I, I want to get your guys' thoughts on this. Do you think that a, a really garbage performance from him was his own doing? Do you think that uh, maybe he just didn't belong playing in this game coming off of a short week? Or how much do we also attribute the fact that it was basically mostly backup receivers except for Sterling Shepard out there? Do, do we think that that might have factored in? What are your guys' thoughts on, on his performance? Uh, I got to say all of the above. You know, the, <laughs> he was yeah. under heavy pressure and losing Andrew Thomas didn't help. Yeah. The Giants receivers, the only one who, the only ones who were getting any kind of separation were Sterling Shepard and Evan Ingram. But, and, and that didn't help, but Jones, he still took a lot of risks. And like you said, Joe, the risks he was getting away with, early in the season he just wasn't getting away with you know he had one early on where taylor rapp basically let what could have been an interception touch the ground yeah so he got away with that one but then after that they just hung on to the ball and his placement was kind of all over the place and yeah the they had drops uh sterling shepherd slipped a couple times but this was just a bad game all over yeah the injuries at wide receiver the injuries on the offensive line no those of course did not help but jones himself was not playing well first game dude on offense the first play i mean was indicative of how this game was going to go Mm -hmm. i mean what happened daniel jones play action tried to take a deep shot and was just absolutely trounced by like three defenders just a complete protection breakdown nate solder beat around the edge I don't know about you. When that happened, I did this. Jeez, so this yeah. is going to be a really, really long <laughs> yeah. game. And Daniel Jones, I mean, he doesn't have a lot of help right now, but we make a lot of excuses for Daniel Jones. And some of those throws were inexcusable. The Taylor Rapp, Evan Ingram one, the one that was dropped, the one you were referring to, that was just a miscommunication between Evan Ingram and Daniel Jones. And Evan Ingram seemed to be in the right. He was moving to space to create extra space from Taylor Rapp. And Daniel Jones didn't anticipate that. They have to be on the same page. First interception to Taylor Rapp. Daniel Jones thought he was going to attach to the in route. It was a levels concept. He ends up sinking to depth. He was wrong in his in, he was wrong in his anticipation and threw an interception. Second one wasn't really his fault. Sterling Shepard slipped on the dig. And then the third one, inexcusable. Curl flat defender to the boundary. And he's trying to hit a curl to the boundary and trying to squeeze the football in, locked on to Dante Pettis. You can't do that. Those are mistakes that rookies make. Those are really, really bad mistakes that you just don't see a lot of quarterbacks making. Daniel Jones, I get it. They were getting blown out at this point, but he just tries to force the football in that situation, throws the interception. But at the same time, man, 
he's lost his left tackle. He, there is no Kadarius Tony. was a huge part of this game plan. No Kenny Galladay, no Darius Slayton, no Saquon Barkley. How many times can this guy just be put in a situation where everybody around him is injured? So I have a little bit of sympathy for him, but we make a lot of excuses for him. I think those things can coexist. It's an unfortunate state of the New York Giants right now, but it's where we are. It's where we are. And then the defense, which was really good in 2020, we'll get into in a little bit. They've regressed significantly, which doesn't help the offense out at all. Puts a lot of stress on Daniel Jones. It's a terrible, terrible state right now what's going on with the new york giants man i feel like and i believe i brought this up before on the podcast i feel like a jets fan bro i just feel like a jaded oh my god <laughs> <laughs> that might be the all-time low here is Who? is that reference and saying that we're the furthest we can go after that is saying we're, we're jaguars fans I, I, I think that's like the that's when we're at, at defcon whatever you know the worst possible scenario that we could possibly be, be in uh speaking of worst possible scenario this offensive line tends to uh, regress at a rate that is just uh, – it's hard to keep up with at this point, especially with the amount of injuries that come into play. Uh, Andrew Thomas barely plays any of this game. He goes down with the injury that was already nagging him apparently. And then Matt Parrott slides in at left tackle, and Nate Solder plays right tackle, which was a little bit confusing um, you know, in, the, in that circumstance because you'd think that maybe the guy who played his entire career at left tackle – would finish the game at left tackle. And then the rookie who's supposed to play right tackle, or sorry, second-year player who's supposed to be playing right tackle would be playing there. But for some reason, we played mix and match, and that led to some problems. What were the issues, though, that you guys saw from this offensive line in a game that's just so blatantly they were they were overmatched by a talented group? That, that was the biggest thing. They were just overmatched. Terrell Lewis, Leonard Floyd, those guys were just too quick off the snap, too explosive, too bendy for Pert and Solder to match up with. You know, I think the Giants initially tried to maybe help their offensive line out because they came out in 12 personnel, the same thing they did last year, or last week. Eh, might as well have been last year. Time's weird. <laughs> but, yeah, they, they might have thought about helping their offensive line out, but whatever they thought, they needed more help. And when you've got an Aaron Donald in the middle – a guy where you have to double or triple team him every play, and he still finds ways to wreck your day. Yeah, that makes it tough for the offensive tackles. And you know, like you said, they were just overmatched and got whooped. That I don't know that there's a whole hell of a lot of real in-depth, nuanced analysis to go there. You know, really, my big question is: Will Will Andrew Thomas? be on the field against the Panthers. Let's hope. Let's hope. Aaron Donald, man, I mean, he's a big reason why this happened, obviously, because so much attention has to be paid wherever he lines up. If that's a four-eye shade, three technique, over the nose, five technique, outside. Wherever he is, you have to ensure that the primary assign the primary offensive lineman who was assigned to him has some sort of help. And that's kind of what happened on that first play. Aaron Donald absolutely, I think, just tore through Billy Price, which led to Matt Skura not helping Andrew Thomas, which led to a miscommunication between Skura and Thomas. And then I think 91 great games ended up kind of getting in between Skura and Thomas and hitting Daniel Jones on that play. But the entire game plan was just kind of just thrown out the window once Andrew Thomas gets hurt because you have two tackles now who need help. Because both those tackles get beat around the edge. Matt Parrott really struggles with where to set his set points and then when to commit his hips up the arc, man. He allows people to get to that outside shoulder so easily. And he's just a turnstile at that point. He has very he really needs a lot of work in terms of protecting that outside shoulder. And we know Nate Solder struggles with that as well. So you have both tackles who are getting blown by Terrell Lewis and Leonard Floyd. And then you have Aaron Donald to worry about in the middle. How is he? <laughs> I feel kind of bad for Jason Garrett that he has to come up with protections to help to help this offensive line, man. You have to keep six guys in there, if not seven at a lot of times. You don't want your quarterback to just get killed. It's not a great situation to be in. And the injuries definitely don't help. You have Nick Gates out. You have Shane Lemieux out. You have Andrew Thomas out in this game. There's no there's no offensive line that should have Nate Solder as a primary starter. And Matt Parrott, we all thought, hey, definitely. We have to start Matt Parrott over Nate Solder. And I agreed with that. But then we see Parrott out there, and it's like, oh, geez, man. This is just a crap situation in general. Yeah, the problems we saw in the preseason game against the Jets, that was kind of who he is. And that's not a great look. 
So the the defensive side of things too, I, I, I don't know if unexpectedly is the right word because they, we knew that they were facing a team that is really starting to hit stride offensively right now. The, the Rams have a, a new quarterback in with Matthew Stafford and he's perfect for running what McVay wants, which has led to some really good offensive outputs already this season. But you would at least expect that this defense led by Patrick Graham might be able to put up a fight on some of these drives. And, and they did get a turnover before Stafford came out. I don't count that second one that McKinney had. There wasn't really a whole lot, I think, in that middle chunk of the game where they just were, like you mentioned earlier, Nick, they, they gave up 28 points in a quarter. I think it was like 31 unanswered. That was when things really started to fall apart. And defensively, they, they just weren't stopping anything. So if we're looking at the defensive performance, what were some of the things that caught our eye that really, really hurt them? Well, I, about this time last week, we heard from Patrick Graham. He said he, you know, the, the giving up 500 yards and getting beat up by the Cowboys was just unacceptable. And he was going to do self-scouting, and he wanted to simplify the defense, get his guys executing better and playing faster. Now, I'm not quite sure what changed. You know, we, I thought maybe we'd see a little bit more press man coverage, but they mixed and matched man and zone concepts about the same rate they have been over the course of the season. And it looked like whatever they did was working to start with. You know, we got those two coverage sacks. Yeah, Matt Stafford was getting chunk plays, but they weren't able to really sustain much of anything. Now, uh, maybe Nick, you maybe you've got some some ideas of what might have changed. The best theory I can come up with is maybe they stripped out some coverage rules out of their zone coverages, and because it looked like they were passing guys off when they were in zone coverage a little bit more fluently than they have been like it was more more drop zone rather than zone match yeah that that's the closest thing i can come up with but of course you know (laughs) nfl game pass being in the state if it's in right now because this wouldn't be our monday podcast if we weren't calling out game pass of course not (laughs) yeah they haven't released the all 22 tape yet so it's tough to get a real good read on it and of course by the second quarter mcveigh had everything figured out and he knew where to go with the ball pretty much every play afterwards. But yeah, you know, the closest thing I can come up with is maybe they tried to simplify the communication and the calls in the back end. But other than that, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what was different. Yeah, we have to wait to see the All-22 to really break that down and give a more elaborate analysis on what actually happened from a coverage standpoint. But I wanted to point out one play, and it was on the – Bobby Trees touchdown drive. This is so New York Giants right here. The Rams are gifting them an opportunity to get Matt Stafford off the field. They take a dumb penalty. Van Jefferson, I think it was a block below the waist, backs the ball up to like a first and 16, and then they have a false start penalty. So you got a first and 21. Daryl Henderson rips off a nine-yard run, I want to say, gets them the second and 12. Still not a great situation, right? It's not a great situation for an offense to be in, but what happens? There's no pressure. Matt Stafford fires a deep corner route to Cooper Cup, and there's three defenders around Cooper Cup, and not one of them can get their hands on the football. The ball is just in the perfect spot. Cooper Cup runs the perfect route, and then they advance for a 28-yard gain. And I'm just like, geez, this this is the Giants' defense in 2021. Even though they were solid before that, those two drives ending on Leonard Williams sacks and also you know half to Dexter Lawrence, it didn't matter because there was a big opportunity. They failed. The offense took advantage of it, and then they got down into the red zone where there was one coverage blown. It seemed like Julian Love couldn't get over the top of Cooper Cup's in route. James Bradbury was, I think, anticipating a flat route there from Robert Woods because he expands laterally, and then nobody covers the OTB route from Woods. Reggie Ragland shades to the two-receiver side in a three-by-two set. Woods catches the ball, turns around. No defender just around him. He just kind of trots into the end zone. <laughs> yeah, it's – at this point, you pretty much just have to laugh. It's – they are just inventing ways to lose games at this point. And uh, yeah, we, I think we all like Patrick Graham, but yep. you know, at, it, 
can't just be the players. It has to be, you know, who is teaching them? Who who's scheming them? It, yeah, the, they can't be surrendering basically seventy five percent completion and letting themselves get gashed in every big situation week after week, and it it not go deeper than the guys on the field. Oh, it's it's collective. It's collective from the general manager down to the last guy on the roster. It's personnel, it's scheme, it's the head coach, it's everything. And you have to kind of call a spade a spade here. It's it's not a good operation going on right now because this is a results-oriented business and the results are losing, just consistent losing. And now it's become embarrassing losing. At least last season they were competitive. Right now it's just really, really embarrassing. You're getting blown out at home. They got blown out essentially by the Broncos in week one. They lost to the Falcons somehow at home. And now you lose this game at home. West Coast team traveling East didn't matter. Could have came from Mars. Like I said, on my podcast, it did not matter. The Rams just took them to, took them the task, man. Yeah. And you know, we talked about, about injuries, but you know, look at the Ravens. They're at least as beat up as the giants are right now. And they dismantled the chargers and, the Chargers are playing really good football. Justin Herbert is balling out of his mind, and they only scored six points. And that was a West Coast team traveling east. Exactly. That's when that theory works. And then when Sean McVay faces Joe Judge and the Giants, that theory is just out the window. It, it disappears. Yeah, it disappears. <laughs> evaporates. So the, the Giants now are, you know, in the circumstance where they have to obviously turn things around against uh, a surging but also – tapering off Carolina Panthers team and we're going to spend some time this week preparing and talking about what's going to come into that going against a, a, a team that has a, a man who has notoriously demolished the Giants in Hassan Reddick and then also Stefan Gilmore who's expected to be returning so we we've got a lot to cover yeah of course of course with the Giants perfect timing of having to face the Nick Panthers. makes the exact same face I did when I realized oh yeah. that's where Hassan Reddick went <laughs> Yeah, so we've, we've got a lot to talk about with that. We're going to dive into the tape and, and preview that matchup later in the week like we typically do. Um, be sure to hit subscribe so you stay up to, date, up to date and you don't miss out on any of that conversation. Thanks for tuning in, folks. Enjoy the rest of your week.